All right. Thank you all. Thanks for joining us on a Friday um, at noon. Uh, I'm certainly grateful to have the opportunity to provide the welcome uh, our own VP for uh, research and partnerships, Tomas Diaz de la Rubia, allowed me to take the uh, beginning part of this, and uh, I'm grateful for this research uh, distinguished lecture, lecture series. And uh, two people that I've known for a long time that have not known me for a long time uh, because their accomplishments uh, are significant. Uh, we're so glad they're with us today. You're going to hear more about each one of them. Uh, but uh, uh, just so you'll have a, a basic introduction before the proper introduction, uh, we have with us Dr. Neil Lane, who is a senior fellow in science and technology policy, Rice University's Baker Institute. Uh, that's Neil waving to us there. While he's accomplished a lot, it's all because of his origins, and that is his academic origin, which is a three-time OU alumnus, uh, a BS, MS, and PhD. Uh, so we take all credit for what Neil has accomplished. Uh, also with us, uh, Norm Augustine, a uh, retired CEO and chairman uh, of that small startup, uh, uh, Lockheed Martin, uh, and we're, uh, we're thrilled to have him here with us. They have a report that they're going to cover, which is the, importance, uh, the important part of this program, and it's the perils of complacency. Uh, America at a tipping point in science and engineering. I've had a chance to look at this in advance. Uh, it, it strikes to the core. Uh, um, the, the it is well titled. Uh, and it strikes to the core of what's presenting us as a country uh, and how critical this moment in time is and how we've arrived at it. Uh, so, you know, as we look at it, I, I, I want to give all the time possible for this presentation. I will say that uh, it, it harmonizes in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a great amount with what we've been doing at the university uh, over the last 18 months. And over the last 18 months, we took a look, uh, realized that while we had accomplished a lot, we had to look, think, look at it through a fresh perspective and really in the, context, the broader context of higher education and what higher education has been through. And when we look at it, uh, we looked up and realized we didn't have a written strategic plan uh, in at least 20, 25 years, which uh, Norm, I'll tell you how to run an organization of some size, but it'd be good to have a written strategic plan. It is. Yeah, no, it is. It is. It's really some deep, uh, deep, uh, deep thinking there. And and, and we took a look at the broadest perspective. And in looking at that, we, we, we asked ourselves, where is higher education and what's taken place? And uh, the reality, which I won't delve too far into right now, is there have been major shifts in higher education. Uh, and what, what's occurred really is massive defunding at the state level. Also, as you'll see from these slides, a decrease uh, in federal funding as well. Uh, putting in jeopardy uh, research, public research universities, which of course are not just essential to the individual and their ability to realize the American dream, uh, but also the very underpinnings uh, of America and its ability to make progress over time. Uh, if those are in jeopardy, if we put in jeopardy uh, public research universities, all that is at risk. And so uh, to do our part, uh, Norm, just so you know, and, and Neil know, uh, we have... Uh, uh, and with a great deal of leadership by Tomas, we put together a strategic plan. Uh, it is exciting. I'll throw in a quick plug for it, ou.edu forward slash lead on. Uh, and it, it speaks to bold, big initiatives that I believe uh, in, a, in, in large part, and this was done through a huge cooperative effort, speak to uh, how critical progress is and what progress looks like uh, at a great public research university in the years to come with real benchmarks. Uh, for us, that means pegging ourselves uh, to public uh, AAU institutions and setting standards for ourselves that are ambitious uh, and only attainable if we look at things uh, uh, with context uh, and, uh, and with some foresight. Uh, again, I know that Tomas will speak to this. Uh, our research centers of excellence are a good example of the direction we're heading. Uh, proud of where we are, but even more proud to have uh, Norm, you and Neil here with us today. Uh, Tomas, I'm going to turn this program over to you, but I want to welcome everyone that's joined us. We have some 71 participants it reflects right now. Thank you for this important conversation and to all who are a part of this. Uh, thank you for caring enough to dedicate uh, this critical part of your Friday towards a problem uh, that, that affects and impacts all of America and well beyond. Thank you. Thank you so much, President Harris, uh, um, and, and thank you for being here this uh, afternoon now with us. Um, uh, it's, it's great to have you do the introduction and, and really to hear about 
uh, the strategic plan that we have, the ambition of the strategic plan to really uh, be one of the nation's top tier public research universities and, and the impact that that can have on the future of not just the nation, but the world um, um, through education and research. Uh, it, it's a great goal. I'm proud to be part of uh, this institution and uh, to help lead uh, some of these areas of research. And, 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 and that is a big part of why we started this uh, distinguished uh, uh, lecture series. And, and I'm really honored and thrilled to have today with us uh, Drs. Neil Lane and Norm Augustine. Um, you know, President Harris uh, um, already introduced them. I mean, they're two icons of American science and engineering, and there's no other way to describe it. The Norm and Neil are two of our foremost thinkers and leaders uh, who constantly remind us of the importance of a strong innovation, technology, science, engineering enterprise for the nation to be um, um, and remain, um, you know, a leader in the world for uh, for good. Um, you know, it, it, I won't belabor this very much, but of course, Neil, uh, as, as President Harris says, is is an uh, OU alum with uh, many many accolades. But uh, you know, you all know he was uh, President Clinton's science advisor and also the director of the National Science Foundation. Um, uh, he's been engaged in many reports. Uh, Perils of Complacency is the follow-up to another report that he and Norm did a few years ago for the American Academy of Arts and Sciences that already raised this issue of uh, where are we and where are we going in enabling and supporting science and engineering at the highest levels. And, uh, you know, Norm Augustine, of course, uh, um, uh, I, I want to mention beyond, of course, uh, his tenure as the CEO of Lockheed Martin, you know, his role uh, as, as Niels with the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine in, in, in really alerting us as a community, alerting the Congress the administration over years and years about the importance of sustaining a strong science and engineering enterprise has been, you know, unparalleled and critical to our success. Uh, the report back in 2007 um, on the uh, uh, rising above the gathering storm uh, that Norm Augustine led at the National Academies was transformational. It was, it was uh, a critical, it came at a critical time and it really changed the trajectory of how the nation uh, uh, supports uh, science and engineering. But we can never uh, rest on our laurels. Uh, that's why Neil and Norm have continued to look at this issue and continue to alert us as to the importance of maintaining the momentum and continuing to grow. So with that, I'm going to let them tell us about uh, their findings and the recommendations for the future. So thank you again, both of you so much for uh, being here with us today. Thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Tomas and, and President Harris. Uh, we're delighted to be with you today. So I'm gonna lead off very briefly, but then turn to Norm to start our report, our discussion of the report. Uh, we regret obviously that we can't be there in person. I mean, everybody regrets that. It's a beautiful campus and extraordinary uh, faculty and staff and student body and so it's, this is not really a substitute but we're happy to be here electronically anyway. Um, I'm going to begin on a personal note as a really proud OU graduate. Of course I miss being able to be on the campus. When I'm, I'm there it brings back memories. Most of them are good memories. My high school sweetheart Johnny and I were OU undergraduates at the same time. I was a physics major with a minor in math and Johnny was a math major with a minor in physics. It's actually a good way to start a relationship Anyway, Johnny went on into computing and she wrote many of my programs, actually, when I was in grad school and, and my career. We married in the summer that we received our baccalaureate degrees. Johnny got a job in computing and supported us while I worked on my PhD at OU. So thank you, OU, for my education, my wife of 60 years and counting, and my career. And by the way, I took government in my first semester and made a C. As a penance for that sin, I spent eight years in Washington working in government, as you mentioned. Tomas has asked us to talk a little bit about the report. And I'm, and I'm, I'm asking Norm to start off by de to describe the origins and the findings of the report. And I'll follow up with a brief summary of our recommendations. Tomas has introduced Norm, but let me say a few more words. I, I first got to know Norm Augustine when I was director of the National Science Foundation. I wanted a towering figure of industry 
known and respected by both political parties in Congress to chair a Blue Ribbon External Review Committee and help me sell a $130 million project to rebuild the research station at the South Pole. Uh, happily, he accepted, NSF got the money, and after a new facility was finally completed several years later, both Norm and I traveled again to the pole to attend the ribbon cutting. And that's only one example of Norm's legendary pro bono contributions to science scholarship and higher education over the decades, as you, Tomas, has already pointed out. So with that, Norm, take it away with our report. Well, thank you. And I'll, I'll correct your story to give the true version of it. Uh, one day, Neil called me and said, how would you like to go uh, south uh, this winter at government expense? And uh, I said, oh, I'd love to do that. And I didn't know he was talking about going to the South Pole. But uh, uh, other than that, uh, let me, Thomas, thank you for your generous comments and President Harris for uh, your support here. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be with you all. And thank you in the audience for your interest in what uh, a number of us believe to be uh, an extremely important issue for our country. And it may seem a little bit incongruous at this point to be speaking of America being at a dangerous tipping point in science and engineering at the very time that Americans are applauding uh, the success uh, of developing and producing a vaccine against COVID-19 within a year's time, but we sometimes forget that it was the investments that were made uh, sometimes decades ago that provided the foundation that made this year's uh, really remarkable uh, uh, accomplishments possible. And the question that we raise in our report is whether America is making the investments today that will assure our nation's competitiveness in the future. And uh, we raise this particularly given the extent of China's, the, uh, the, the, of the People's Republic of China, China's rise uh, in science and technology and other areas. Uh, America's economy uh, together with our freedom uh, really underpins America's strength. And there've been a number of studies, including two that uh, formed the basis of Nobel prizes that have shown that up to 85% of the growth in America's GDP is attributable to advancements in just two fields, namely science and engineering. Uh, Clearly, we're not going to compete with China uh, economically, militarily, or most other areas based on the relative size of our populations. If America is to be competitive in this world and seems to be evolving, it will be because of our uh, investment in innovation, in competitiveness, creative, creativeness, knowledge, and the likes. And so if I could go through a few charts here quickly, if I could have the first one, I'd like to address uh, some of those issues. Uh, we can go to the next chart. Uh, I should have mentioned that our study was sponsored by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences together with uh, Rice University's James Baker Institute of Public Policy. And uh, this chart uh, points uh, quantitatively to what I've really just said. This is the number of first degrees granted in science and engineering uh, in China in the red, and the United States in blue. The United States being relatively flat and the Chinese curve uh, having well surpassed us. Uh, this is of course not surprising given that China's population is four times the size of, of the United States. On the other hand, uh, it does point to a trend that we see over and over as we've conducted our study in various areas, a few of which I'll share with you. Next chart, please. Uh, I'll let you read this. That was Wen Jiabao, the former premier of the state council of the PRC. And uh, his view is quite widely expressed when one goes to China and talks to people. Uh, China clearly understands the importance of science and engineering. One reason for that being that uh, virtually the entire leadership for China, of China for in several decades have been engineers. Uh, that's changing a little bit at the present time. But uh, 
China will not overlook this, uh, this opportunity or this challenge. Next chart, please. This is the uh, original report uh, to which uh, was referred earlier. Uh, the Restoring the Foundation report that was conducted about six years ago. And it was a look uh, primarily at basic research uh, in the United States. And our report raised the concern that uh, we were becoming less and less competitive worldwide. Uh, the next chart shows a cover of the current report uh, the, the perils of complacency. And this report was prepared because the same group of us who wrote the first report were concerned that uh, it sits, or during this interim period, the circumstances had become much more uh, compelling, and much more uh, concerning. Uh, the next chart, please. This will show the members of our committee, there are 20 people. Uh, they come from uh, their university presidents, their uh, uh, form pres uh, former presidential appointees, there are some CEOs of various companies, uh, there are uh, former members of Congress, uh, uh, a couple of Nobel laureates, and the really the astonishing thing is that our report uh, was such that all 20 people supported the findings and the recommendations unanimously. Next chart. This is sort of a summary chart. Uh, the yellow bar, the declining bar, uh, shows the uh, percent of all the total US R&D funding from all sources. Excuse me, uh, the yellow bar shows the part of that that's uh, uh, been funded by the government, federal government. And it used to be about two thirds of the total of R&D. Uh, today it's about one, it's about a quarter actually. Uh, at the same time, industry, the blue bar and others uh, tried to pick up some of the difference uh, going from about 40% uh, some years ago up to today where it's about two thirds. Uh, the problem here is that industry with the pressures of the economy and its, its shareholders uh, is very reluctant to invest in long-term things such as research and development and I might add education uh, because the payoff is so distant and so risky in the former case. Uh, what we see is a, a, a crossover uh, some years ago, and uh, we also see that the basic research uh, is almost entirely funded by the government. Uh, the uh, companies simply can't afford to invest in long-term things like basic research, and, and don't. Uh, we see that with the decline of places like uh, Xerox PARC and IBM Research and GE Schenectady, and the canonical case would probably be Bell Labs, which today is owned by a company in Finland. Uh, next chart. This looks at the situation a little differently. It raises a curious question. Uh, this is the uh, federal outlays uh, for this uh, uh, research and development as a percentage of uh, uh, total discretionary spending, uh, the latter in a short form, meaning uh, uh, funding by the government uh, that's not already committed under to law. And we see that for a long time, half a century, uh, the government has been devoting about 10% uh, of its discretionary money to research and development. Uh, that looks like a pretty stable situation, but there are several problems. One is it overlooks what China is doing, the growth. Uh, number two, uh, research and development plays a much more important role in America and its economy today than it did back in the 1970s. Uh, and number three, the discretionary portion of the federal budget is gradually dis disappearing. And Neil's going to talk about that a little later. Let's go to the next chart. I've talked about uh, financial capital. Let me talk a little bit about human capital, since those are the probably the two most important ingredients in competitiveness in research and development. This chart shows the scores, various nations and entities in, in the PISA test, uh, which is a test conducted every couple of years. Uh, it's international and uh, it conducts uh, score students in, who are 15 years old in reading science and math. And the shown here 
uh, for these countries is the combined reading science of math score. And uh, you will see the United States now ranks 25th out of the 31 so-called developed countries that are considered as part of this overall test. Uh, there are only six countries behind us. Uh, and I should also note that the United States has been declining in its position uh, for the last decade or so. Let's go to the next chart. Uh, the question arises, how has America done so well in science and technology in the last few decades with the K through 12 system that uh, on average is basically failing in terms of international competitiveness? And a major part of the answer to that is that our nation has been able to attract principally to its higher education system, uh, largely our public universities that graduate 70% of the graduates, undergraduates in this country. Uh, and these people, many of them have chosen to stay here after they receive their degrees and raise their families here, uh, live in the American uh, society and make enormous contributions. And, Today, uh, about 39% of the doctoral degrees awarded in natural science and engineering uh, uh, are coming from people who are temporary residents and uh, many will stay, fortunately. The next chart uh, looks at the same data slightly differently. It's what fraction of the total STEM workforce, science, technology, engineering, and management uh, is based on foreign born individuals? who have come here and stayed here. And today you see that uh, it's, it's between 20 and 25%. And that if anybody has had the occasion as I have recently uh, to deal with senior leadership uh, in our government or with be uh, deal with our hospitals, uh, one discovers that uh, they simply would not operate were it not for the talent that's represented in these two bars. Uh, the uh, leadership in science and technology in our government, much of it was attracted here from abroad. Unfortunately, we're taking steps that Neil will mention that are making it more difficult for such people to come here or to stay here once they've received their degrees. Next chart. This is a report card, a kind of a summary. Uh, the United States in terms of its rank among nations and in investment in research and development at purchasing power parity is hanging on at first place. China is rapidly advancing and could be expected to uh, pass us in the next few years. In terms of innovation, we've dropped from first to eighth place. And that's by the uh, Bloomberg measures incidentally. Research and development is a fraction of GDP an extremely important measure because it suggests uh, what percent of the economy uh, R&D has to support. We've dropped from first to 10th place among nations. Primary and secondary education, I just showed 25th place among developed nations. Uh, professionals engaged in research and development per capita, a 28th place fraction of research funded by the federal government, we're in 29th place. And the fraction of initial degrees awarded in engineering uh, we're in 76th place. Uh, we're just slightly ahead of Mozambique. Next chart. Uh, this is sort of a summary output chart. Uh, it shows the number of companies in the global Fortune 500. Uh, somewhat a member of e measure of economic activity. It's a measure of jobs. Uh, this chart, I should caution, is uh, categorizes a company by the country in which its headquarters is located. But given all of that, I think the trend is extremely clear. Uh, the blue bars representing the United States show a gradual decline. Uh, the red bars represented by the PRC, uh, a rapid raise. And in fact, just after this chart was made, China did pass us and uh, now has more companies in the global Fortune 500 than we. Their definition of global, uh, excuse me, of a company is somewhat different. But the indicator, I think, in terms of uh, jobs, economic activity is, is fairly uh, evident. Next chart, please. At this point, we'll turn to Neil, who's going to uh, talk a little bit about our findings and uh, the recommendations we're making, and then we'll have time for questions. Neil? Thank you, Norm. Um, 
Uh, before I uh, talk about the recommendations, let me say up front, which I think is obvious, our particular report is focused on science and engineering research, but our committee's concerns about the future of higher education are not intended to be parochial. Top universities like this one uh, possess strength across the full palette of arts and humanities and social sciences, as well as the natural sciences, mathematics, engineering, business, and so forth. And that medicine, that certainly needs to continue. Now, in preparing this update report, uh, the committee examined its earlier recommendations, and we concluded they're still valid, and they're included as an appendix in the new report. But we chose to highlight a small number of the recommendations up front that we believed are particularly timely, and those are the ones I'll briefly summarize. If you're interested in more detail, we really encourage you to check out the full report. Uh, PDFs are available at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences website or Rice University's Baker Institute websites. Both places uh, have access to the report. So first, among our recommendations, we must grow the total R&D investments uh, by this country, especially federal support of research. More specifically, we recommend an increase of federal funding of basic research, uh, most of which occurs in universities, by at least 50% from 0.2 to 0.3% of GDP, with a similar increase in applied research. We make the argument to the policymakers that basic research funded by the federal government is where the truly pathbreaking discoveries are made. And most of that work is done in universities where the next generation of scientists and engineers are being nurtured. Talent is the immediate return on investment of this federal funding. Uh, applied research is a key step toward innovation and should grow at at least the same rate. This recommendation implies increasing federal and applied research funding from roughly $80 billion, where it is now, to $120 billion per year. This recommendation may seem modest, given uh, all uh, that we have argued in the circumstances today. Um, and compelling arguments can be made for even more aggressive funding goals. Certainly large increases in base funding are needed in the next couple of years. So for example, reaching our target of 0.3% GDP, say in five years, would be consistent with the recommendations we're making. Second, we recommend that President Biden set a new national goal to increase total R&D spending for the public and private, all sources, from its present 2.7% of GDP, where it's been for a long time, to at least 3.3% of GDP. Uh, Norm mentioned earlier that the US ranking has fallen to 10th place among developed nations by this measure of national priority. Several past presidents have set 3% as a goal, but we've never gotten there. We think it's time for a more ambitious target to see if we can't make some progress. Again, compelling arguments can be made to be even more aggressive. Next, we argue for some improvements in the federal budget process, uh, which hasn't worked well for a long time. We recommend the President and Congress agree on a rolling five-year R&D plan, fund research on a two-year budget cycle, and establish a capital budget for R&D for the first time. U.S. is one of the first developed, one of the few developed countries that has no long-term strategy for science, technology, and innovation, no plan for R&D funding, no mechanism for overall planning. Uh, one reason we're in danger of falling behind is because we don't look ahead. President Harris pointed out all organizations, if they wish to prosper down the road, need to have a plan as OU has recently developed. Well, the federal government needs a plan and it needs one right away. The congressional annual budget process is simply not working. It's pretty obvious to anybody. It hinders planning by the agencies and probably it wastes money. We also recommend the Office of Management and Budget, OMB, and the research funding agencies have a look at and where possible, simplify, streamline, eliminate regulations that have been piled one on top of the other. They're costing research time. They're adding to universities overhead. And, and, and actually in the area of, of cooperation with other countries, uh, they're, they're having tragic consequences in the lives and careers of some, some researchers around the country. Large number of studies and reports, for example, by the Council on Government Relations, COGR, and the National Science Board 
have pointed to the growing burden of outdated federal rules and regulations that offer little or no benefit to the nation. We don't need any more studies about those. We just need action. Several administrations have worked on these issues, but progress has been slow. This was certainly something that OU's former Vice President for Research, Kelvin Drogemeyer, was hoping to get done as Director of OSTP. Next slide, please. We also uh, offer a number of recommendations that address the needs to improve education of America's youth and enhance the nation's educated and skilled workforce, both in size and in quality. In order to improve public K-12, pre-K-12 education, we endorse the recommendations of the uh, earlier National Academies reports rising above the gathering storm that uh, Tomas talked about. As you may know, Norm chaired that study and, uh, and, uh, co and can certainly comment on any of the recommendations if you have questions at the end. In order to strengthen the government university industry partnership, which really still doesn't exist in this country, we recommend that universities and industries share best practices on cost containment and capital planning and increase overall cooperative efforts. State governments need to restore funding for public colleges such as OU and, and, and universities such as OU and at least to at least pre-2008 levels. And Congress certainly needs to repeal the tax on endowment earnings of many private universities and colleges, just lead to increased tuition and, and decrease quality of, of the education they provide. Federal government should revise IRS guidance, certainly clarify it and regulations, and perhaps change the tax code to encourage stronger university industry collaboration to get the benefits of what we're doing in the university laboratories out to private industry so the American people uh, can profit from those. And in order to attract the best talent from across the globe, we support recommendations made by many other organizations, including the President's Council of Advisors on Science uh, and uh, uh, Technology uh, and the National Academies, both to increase the number of H-1B visas and to reshape policies affecting foreign-born students and researchers to encourage them to settle with their families in America, as Norm has already commented. Policymakers need to understand what Norm has described that the United States has attained its prominence in science and technology and its leadership in the world economy by attracting the best and brightest from all over the globe, including China. Almost 30% of university science and engineering faculty and half of our postdoctoral researchers were born abroad. The US will not compete with China and other nations of the world in terms of numbers, the population, the workforce, even the numbers of scientists and engineers. We will compete by better educating our youth and encouraging more US born boys and girls, especially women and underrepresented groups to seek careers in science and engineering while continuing to welcome young people from all over the world who wish to study in the US, follow our rules, launch their careers, start companies, grow the economy and become a part of American society. And just to add a personal comment, the recent rise of xenophobic political rhetoric and what I would say very harmful immigration policies are as threatening to the future of the country as most anything I could name. Of course, we expect everyone to follow our laws and government and university regulations, but to imply that someone from a particular country is automatically suspect is completely at odds with traditional American values and it really needs to stop. U.S. also owes its prominence in science and technology to international cooperation in basic research open collaboration between US researchers and their counterparts in other nations, including China. If we close the doors to such cooperation, if we turn off the lights to sharing fundamental knowledge and the false belief that all the brilliant ideas and discoveries are made in the US, we will pay a heavy price downstream. President Reagan's National Security Decision Directory 189 underscores this point and is still valid. I want to say something now about the rationale for our funding recommendation, because there are always many more demands on the federal budget than money to meet them. So one has to have an argument to get any attention. Next slide, please. This figure shows the federal government's investment in basic research over time. The left chart shows the history of federal basic research funding as a percentage of GDP. That's the solid dark blue curve. 
the figure on the right is the same information I'm talking about, but in constant 2020 dollars. Uh, frankly, the Congress appropriates dollars, not a fraction of GDP. But it's important to think about it as a fraction of the overall economy, if we believe, as we do, that it is a serious investment in the future. Look at the blue curve. In the late 70s through the early 90s, federal research basic funding, basic research funding, was on a steady real growth path of over 4% above inflation per year, which had it continued, that's the light blue dashed curve at the top, would have reached 0.3% GDP by now. But starting in the mid 90s, some of us will remember those times, the bottom fell out. Congress focused on downsizing government, especially non-defense government, including science. The cross-hatched area just simply points to the accumulated loss in funding and uh, to the, uh, uh, and the likely discoveries and the inventions and the skilled workforce that we have missed by not making those investments. It can take two or more decades, Norm commented on this, for the fruits of basic research to impact the economy. We're still benefiting from that funding back in the 70s and early 80s and that period of research growth, e even still benefiting from the Apollo era, era a decade earlier. Our recommendation is to get back on track, grow basic research funding by at least 4% in real terms, that's the green dashed curve, and to reach 0.3% GDP as soon as possible, that's the yellow dash curve, with the same target for applied research. Reaching 0.3% GDP in the next year or two would add $20 billion to new basic research funding and another 20 billion for applied research, part of which goes to universities. The devastating impact of the pandemic on this country should serve as a warning that business as usual, that's the dark blue dash curve, is sorely inadequate. Next slide, please. This is a checklist. This is a checklist uh, coming from uh, the front end of our report. And uh, what it really does, I've checked all the boxes. What it really says is what business as usual has been, what our policymakers have really been doing or rather not doing. And I won't read all the items. What it was essentially saying here is the things we're recommending, the policymakers have not been doing. And unless we turn that around, the country's future is not bright. Next slide, please. There is one large obstacle the administration and Congress will face, to be fair, in trying to deal with all the challenges, the rapidly rising national debt. The Congressional Budget Office CBO figure that we're shown here in this chart shows the past and projected future revenues. That's the red curve, past history, future projection under law. And the various categories and, and estimates, and the various categories of non discretionary spending layered at the bottom. So, security, Medicare, Medicaid, interest on the debt, and the other mandatory spending as a percentage of GDP. But note, it does not reflect the COVID relief spending nor the temporary drop in GDP in 2020 due to COVID's impact on the economy. The gap between revenues and non discretionary spending, that's the blue arrow is the amount of money available then for everything else, defense, health, housing, science, space, commerce, and so forth. In 2020, spending outlays are about $4.7 trillion. That's 21% of GDP, that's the red dot. The 2020 deficit, that's the red arrow, is about $1 trillion. That's 4.6% of GDP. Uh, you might say plus another 2 trillion for COVID, which is not shown on this chart. The main takeaway we intend from this figure is that by 2040 or so, all the revenues will be needed for non-discretionary budgets. And unless taxes are increased, the US will have to borrow the money it needs to operate government. <clears throat> None of the options are easy politically. So research will likely get squeezed along with everything else, unless, and this is our message, unless science is considered a higher priority than it has been for many decades. Let me just finish with a couple of personal comments, not in the report. We currently have a political system in disarray and a public deeply divided along many dimensions. We should have been looking ahead for a long time now, developing serious bipartisan strategies and policies to meet the challenges we face as a nation. 
Indeed, instead, many of our political leaders are either distracted or other by other matters, or they're just unable to agree on what to do. It's a tough job. We have a new administration coming in. President Biden, Vice President Harris, and their team will face almost unimaginable problems at home and abroad. But if Congress works with the Biden-Harris administration, these challenges can be met. Fair to ask if our report will make any difference. Well, we don't know. It's impossible to predict. Reports come and go. Recommendations come and go. And it's hard, hard to tell what the outcome will be. But the value, we believe, of studies like this one and the reports we're discussing today is to keep the conversation going. Make sure policymakers continue to pay attention, or we remind them they should pay attention, and keep reminding them as often as necessary. Norm and I are filling our calendar with Zoom calls, reaching as many members of Congress as we can get to, and we're reaching out to the Biden-Harris team as well. Uh, that the official transition is underway. And so far, we found general support for recommendations from both parties. There are issues. Conservatives are starting to worry about the federal deficits. Lawmakers of both, lawmakers of both parties are worried about China and, and, uh, chi and, and the incidents, possibly, of China interference in, uh, in, our, in our, our own uh, uh, taking advantage of intellectual property and developing our economy and so forth, and the cost of higher education is on everybody's mind. There are also some positive developments. COVID, of course, is not positive, but it's highlighted the, the importance of science. The Biden-Harris campaign made some bold promises. There are several bills, like Schumer Young's Endless Frontier Act, show bipartisan recognition for the need to do something. So now we need to see the action been a long tradition of bipartisan support for research and other organizations are likely coming forward with bold recommendations. In the end, it's going to take a major effort by a large number of institutions like this one and concerned citizens to get Washington's attention to what we consider a threat to the nation's future. That's more than enough talk for me. I'm going to turn back to Norm if he has any final comments to add. Norm? Thanks, Neil. Uh, we have time for questions, and uh, I just would briefly say, uh, again, a personal standpoint, I, my background is largely in industry. I'm an engineer, aerospace engineer, uh, but uh, from the looking from a perspective of a person from industry, uh, uh, it looks to me like we're headed toward a, a, a serious challenge uh, that it will be easier to solve if we take steps now than if we wait uh, 10 years to try to begin to take steps. Our, our choices will be diminished with time. And I uh, just would echo Neil that uh, I hope that those of you in the audience who are also concerned about the decision <clears throat> will help us in speaking out and trying to uh, convince the leaders of our country uh, of the importance of research, of education, uh, to, to the nation and to uh, really to the American dream. With that, uh, I think, Tomas, we turn to you. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you both uh, so very much. That was fascinating, uh, a fantastic tour of uh, where we're at and uh, where, my, where we might be headed. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, uh, but I do have an accent. Um, <laughs> No, we haven't noticed, no. Uh, you haven't noticed, yeah. right? okay. Um, I, I do still, yeah, no, kidding aside, I do, and, and I really appreciate your comments uh, on the American dream, on uh, the importance of uh, bringing young people from around the world to this country like I did 40 years ago and uh, staying here and uh, becoming part of that uh, amazing enterprise that is the United States. Uh, we got to continue doing that. So thank you for, for all those comments on a personal basis. Uh, for the audience, you know, we have uh, the Q&A um, uh, open on the, at the bottom of the screen in your Zoom uh, screen. Uh, you can go there and put your questions. Uh, we have some questions on the Q&A. Um, I'm going to uh, read some of those as we go along. Uh, um, and uh, let me start with one of our guests, a uh, very distinguished guest, uh, Anne Peterson, who I know you both know very well. Uh, Anne is, is saying thank you for this important report and for your presentation. How can all of us help the effort to gain implementation of the recommendations for redressing the serious, these serious issues? Neil, you go ahead. You're on mute. 
Sometimes I'm better on mute. Okay, but uh, but I'll make it. First of all, Ann, hi. I mean, thank you so much for tuning in and coming, uh, coming on the report. I mean, Ann was deputy director, you all know, of NSF for a number of years, did an outstanding job, and then has done this extraordinary work in, in uh, the philanthropic community, uh, especially with you know, helping uh, people in Africa uh, in, in uh, just uh, in incredibly poor circumstances. So thank you so much for that question. Um, of course, uh, I, th I think the, uh, the w one thing to say is, keep, is everybody keep doing what you're doing because uh, this, th these issues we're talking about, uh, while we're addressing our report to policymakers, they're really uh, not gonna do a lot without uh, hearing from their constituents. Uh, and that, that then goes right back home uh, to uh, uh, you know, Michigan where Ann is shivering in the snow and and Oklahoma and Iowa and you know out, out of the way rural areas. I mean, all over this great country. So um, what I generally suggest is in addition to everybody speaking with their member of Congress and their local officials and universities lobbying, uh, I mean, that's in a soft way, I guess, on behalf of these issues we're talking about, um, finding ways to get the message back home where people live, especially all these people in America who somehow feel left out and in many cases legitimately and legitimately have been left out of much of the progress that the country's made. And of course, we, we've heard about that politically. Um, a university like Oklahoma and public universities and some privates across the country have the best sense, I, I think, of how their communities, their counties, their cities, their states uh, can best get the message about the benefits that they're really receiving from science and technology and the federal investment in research. Uh, so uh, while I, I, that's hard and I don't have a suggestion about how to do it more easily, I think unless we can get the message out to more of the American people than we've been able to do, it's something that I've been preaching about called the civic scientist message, then uh, we're gonna have a hard time getting the policymakers to move. Norm? Well, just a brief footnote. Uh, it's interesting that uh, public polls show that the public holds scientists in very high regard. And uh, <clears throat> the problem we've found as we've talked to a lot of people is that uh, much of the public doesn't relate to, with the exception of uh, COVID, a huge exception, doesn't relate what scientists do to their own lives. And uh, I'm always intrigued, for example, uh, people with their cell phones, uh, uh, with all due credit to to uh, to uh, uh, Apple for its creativity and innovation, uh, the fact is that it wasn't Apple that made cell phones possible. It was made possible by breakthroughs by scientists, uh, not last year, but 10, 15, 20 years ago, uh, working uh, in, the, in quantum science and other fields, and uh, people take for granted. Uh, I can remember when, when Dan Golden was uh, administrator of NASA, he was speaking at a uh, uh, public forum and was taking questions. And somebody said, do you, you uh, argue for more money for science in the space program? Uh, uh, why, well, and you, you argue for more weather satellites. Why do, why do we need more weather satellites and the likes? And, and uh, the person said, uh, we, we already have the weather channel. And uh, <laughs> unfortunately, that's, uh, that kind of sad and semi-humorous story uh, is not so humorous when you think about it. Back to you, Thomas. You're on mute. Yes, the story of my life these days. Uh... <laughs> uh, let me go back to the top. Uh, Darren Porcel uh, is asking, how would you propose incentivizing or subsidizing the private sector to think in longer term horizons to increase their investment? I suppose in basic research, but also applied. Maybe Norm, you want to start with that? Sure, so I'd be glad to. The, uh, uh, there are a lot of things that can be done relatively quickly. Uh, one is to make the uh, 
R and D uh, uh, deduction uh, permanent. Uh, the problem with it being temporary uh, is people don't want to get started in a ten-year R and D project uh, uh, if the support for it is likely to vanish uh, one year from now. It's like going to a builder and saying, "I want you to build me a new house," and each year I'll tell you how much money you have and what how many rooms I want on it. Uh, another thing that uh, actually I've promoted for more longer than I can remember with absolutely no success that addresses the issue of the short-termness of, uh, of the business world as well as the government. The government kind of has a heartbeat of two years of uh, industry. It's gotten to be about one quarter of a year. And my proposal was that uh, or is that uh, we change the capital gains tax law and we make the capital gains law such that uh, the gains uh, on an asset that is held for one year. Let me, let me make this extreme. The gains that are held for one day are taxed at a 99% rate. The gains that are held, uh, made on an asset held 10 years are taxed at a 1% rate. And draw whatever monotonic curve you want between the two that produces whatever tax revenues you need. And boy, that would change overnight the way industry and investors and CEOs uh, would look at what they're, they're, they're doing. And uh, uh, today we've got uh, a good share of the stock market uh, uh, operates uh, literally on microseconds, the, the day traders. Uh, the, uh, when I first went into the business world, when I graduated from college, uh, the average shareholder held their shares eight years. Today, that's four months declining. And uh, as long as that's the case, industry simply isn't going to be able to invest in long-term undertakings. And so thank you for the question because we need some fundamental changes here. Okay, thank you. Uh, Neil, anything on your end to add or to that? No, go ahead, take another question. Okay, great. Okay, so Joe so Zo, uh, one of our uh, um, phenomenal, fantastic scientists at University of Oklahoma is asking, uh, great talk, uh, how can the R&D budget be increased to 3.3% of GDP, given the fact that we're under huge deficits? I know you addressed some of these before, but he's, what are the best strategies to solve this dilemma? Well, I can, I can start with just a comment or two and then I'll let Norm yeah. add his wisdom on this. Um, well, one issue we haven't, one of our recommendations you, you may re remember uh, was to was to capitalize our federal R&D expenditures or some significant part of it. The idea being, we even heard this from one of our Congress, uh, members of Congress that we spoke with in the last few weeks, that the federal government ought to have a balance sheet, that there's a difference between spending money for long-term investment and spending money for operating expenses. And the federal government just doesn't make that distinction. So, mm -hmm. so that involves the kind of change in the budget process that, that we're recommending. Norm, you want to add? No, I think that you hit the central thrust. Uh, why don't we just go ahead and take another question? Great. Um, I'm going to combine two questions together here, one from Hazen Rafai and one from Hank Jenkins Smith, because I think they, they are, they're related in some sense. Uh, Hazem is asking, uh, about you know how do we adapt these recommendations given the political uh, environment between the main the two main parties and the mistrust that exists now in Washington, and I think Hank is uh, expanding on that and, and uh, asking whether we envision the shifting global environment as creating the possibility for a renewal sense a renewed sense of common threats and opportunities globally. So it's both within our own political system, but also. Globally, you know, do you do you see strategies and things that might be positive changes that could lead to uh, better outcomes in the future? Norm, you want to start? Okay, I, I think uh, with the the with our conversations we've had with a lot of members of Congress, I noticed a big change relative to where we were uh, 10, 15 years ago when we did the Gathering Storm Report. At that time. Uh, there was very little interest in uh, science and technology by writ large on the Hill. Uh, whereas this time, uh, there's a considerable awareness uh, of the growing importance of science and technology. Uh, 
on the hill relative to where it was before. And I think there, there is nobody who tells us that they disagree with the arguments we make. They don't agree, with, disagrees with our facts. Uh, they just need to uh, keep being re-reminded of the importance of this. And uh, unfortunately, they, they will be reminded by the, the, with the economy one day. Uh, but uh, preferably, we don't have to wait until that day. And I think it's so important that people, scientists do have credibility. Uh, but if, if I'm to be totally candid as a non-member of the science community, the, the, the science community has not done a great job of uh, telling the story of how they impact the average person's life. And uh, I think if more people can get out and convey that message, uh, I, I think that there's, there's the seeds of some hope on the hill. In your broader question, uh, if there's anything we ought to be able to agree upon, uh, it should be science and uh, development and the likes. And yes, there are some issues with little segments of it or important sub-segments, but writ large, we should be able to uh, get the parties to a considerable degree of agreement. Neil? Well, I would just add that uh, in our conversations with with the members, and, and in, in some sense, this has always been the case, but now it's quite striking. You can actually have a uh, adult conversation with a member of Congress that uh, maybe is has taken a very strong position publicly about other things mm -hmm. that you might not agree with, and, and but, but remarkably, in a more private setting, which means uh, often settings in the Congress, and work with the administration that are off the radar screen, that are not out in the media. Once it gets out in the media, then this polarization uh, just flourishes. People say things that are really unhelpful to compromise and the media amplifies that. And of course the media now is a much different animal than it was in, in past decades. So I think the encouraging thing is that work can go on and is going on rather quietly I know that kind of foreign to what a democracy ought to be. We ought to be open and that ought to be shared. Well, the reality is um, things get in the way of really getting such information out to the general public. So it's encouraging that that is the case. It's encouraging that Schumer and Young and their counterparts in the Sorry. house Sorry. have gotten together Sorry. to come out with that endless frontier act. It's a very bold uh, member uh, piece of legislation uh, frankly, uh, if, they, if that were to happen, you would immediately accomplish these goals that Norman and I are talking about. When you think about going from 2.7 to 3.3% of GDP for the entire investment, public and private in R&D, I mean, remember a 0.3% is just a bit over 20, 21 a billion dollars. Yeah. So, so, you know, you multiply by six, and we're talking about 120, 30, 150 billion dollars oh, for, sure. for public and private. I mean, it's just oh. not yeah. a lot of money compared with the trillions of dollars right. that come out uh, to meet other needs. So, so we need to keep doing our thing as you are doing at your institution and as the science community in the way that Norm has described, we need to do much better ourselves uh, because the numbers are not scaring. You know, just a little factoid or two with that regard. Uh, today in the United States, uh, as Americans, we spend more on potato chips than we spend on clean energy research. Uh, we spend one tenth of one percent of the GDP on uh, biomedical research, but we spend 18 percent of the GDP in growing on health care. Uh, it just seems that our balance, the money, and, and if you look at our K through 12 system, uh, we spend more than any other nation in the world except one uh, per student on our K through 12 system. Uh, in that case, it's not what we spend, it's how we spend it. And so right. uh, there are a lot of opportunities for answers out there. And I'm cutting back on potato chips. <laughs> <laughs> you and me both. Uh, we're at the top of the hour, but, uh, um, you know, if, if you don't mind, I, I'd love to just put out another question from the audience sure. and then uh, maybe we'll, okay. So one, one more, uh, my, my very good friend and colleague from many years at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, Donna Crawford, uh, 
is in the audience and uh, from California. And she's asking, uh, thank you for this great talk and report. How do we begin to address the public's growing distrust of a science? I think it's a really important question. To your point, Norm, about scientists doing better with the public, there is a distrust of science out there. How do we, how do we start to address that? Neil, you might be better to answer that. I'm, I'm not better, but, but I'll start just in the interest of time. Uh, I think much depends on how this uh, handling of the pandemic uh, relates in the minds of most Americans to science. And we recognize that's already complicated because it's gotten so politicized. But this pandemic moment is, yeah. is kind of like the Sputnik moment. It is a, it is a point in time to have this conversation with the larger public. And, and I personally think to do that, of course we should each do it individually with our families and friends and neighbors and so forth and the civic scientist idea. But institutions need to sit down at the table together and decide on a, on a positive message about this pandemic and science. And of course, all the other issues we talked about today, but the pandemic moment is the time to have that conversation. Norm? Yes, I think uh, we have an opportunity today and uh, it, it just requires a lot of legwork. Uh, people have to get out and talk to their friends, to their local lunch groups and what have you about uh, what the role of science is in our lives. Uh, like electricity, we take it for granted until the power goes off. And, uh, then we suddenly realize how important it is. And, <laughs> I think back, uh, going back maybe 30 years uh, when I was gainfully employed uh, in industry, I was very much concerned about the lack of investment in research at our universities. And I got, uh, it's hard for the universities to make that case. Others have to help. And I got 24 uh, CEOs of Fortune 100 companies to join me in uh, putting their signature below a statement I had drafted on the importance of research at universities. And just to get 24 CEOs of Fortune 100 companies to agree that today is Friday, it's not easy. And, uh, I had all these signatures. So we go to the major media outlets and ask them to print it as an op-ed. And every one of the major outlets came back to us and said uh, they didn't want to print it. We said, well, why not? And they said, the subject's just not of interest to our readers. <laughs> and uh, that's changed, I think. Today, the yeah, subject is of interest to readers. And from our contacts on the Hill, Neil, uh, it's of interest there too. It's unfortunately, it's not number one on their list, but it's of interest there. And so uh, we may have uh, maybe the last chance here, right? as you look at that curve of the disappearing discretionary funds, uh, this may be the time we have to really make the case. Well, I think, uh, I think we're all on board with you um, here at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, we want to be part of the solution. Uh, we're working hard at that, and uh, we want to go out and make the case. I can't thank you enough, enough uh, for, for I, I only wish, as you said earlier, that we were here in person, because I have a little uh, memento, a little gift uh, to present to you um, uh, that Michelle is, we, we have this uh, globe uh, that, you know, represents the, the the global nature of, of science and engineering and technology and, and research uh, that we want to present to you. Uh, we'll send those to you, uh, to your homes, and uh, you'll receive them from us uh, commemorating this, this, uh, this lecture today. And uh, we really look forward to uh, seeing you in person at the university, uh, welcoming you here uh, in the not too distant future and continuing the conversation. Uh, we have a lot of questions left in the Q&A uh, section. I think if you don't mind, what we'll do is we'll collect them and yeah. send them to you by email and, uh, right. and then we can get back. If, if that's okay with you, we can get back to the... To the Absolutely. And thank you Great. so much, Super. the president. Thank, thank you yeah. so much. And, and let us know. I mean, these questions will help us know how Norm and I can... can uh, uh, continue to work on this effort. Uh, you have lot, lots of bright thoughts out there and we welcome uh, the ideas that are coming from your community. And uh, thank you for letting us be with you today. Of course, thank you so much. We'll, we'll talk soon then. All right. Bye-bye. Be careful. Bye, bye everybody. Have a good day. Thank you.